Hi guys, here is Dr. Benaduce. In this lecture, I will go over fundamental knowledge I need you to have for us to study very important skeletal muscles we have in our body and make sense of why they fall under a specific category, under a specific classification, and why they cause that specific movement when they contract. So let's get started. We have over 650 skeletal muscles in our body. The good news is we are not studying them all. So you don't need to freak out. The main goal is to focus on the skeletal muscles that we are also studying in our lab. The great majority of our skeletal muscles attach to bones, but we also have skeletal muscles that attach to other muscles and to our skin. Now, every single skeletal muscle has several skeletal muscle cells. And we know that every single skeletal muscle cell is basically the length of the skeletal muscle it is making up. And that every single skeletal muscle cell has several nuclei. And they have these striations. And these striations are a consequence of the organized arrangement of the thin and thick filaments that we have inside of each skeletal muscle cell. And when we look inside of each skeletal muscle cell, we see myofibrils. And myofibrils are a sequence of sarcomeres, the muscle units. And when we zoom in into the sarcomeres, we see thick and thin filaments. Thick filaments are composed of the myosin protein, and thin filaments are composed of actin protein, and also those regulatory proteins, remember, which are called troponin and tropomyosin. Now, this is within a skeletal muscle cell. I just drew one myofibril with myofilaments inside it. And as the name says, myofilaments are the filaments, which makes you recall that the filaments are the thin filaments and the thick filaments. And when we look inside a skeletal muscle cell, we see several myofibrils, which again are composed of the thin and thick filaments. Now, for a muscle cell to contract, we need lots of energy. So, for sure, inside of every single skeletal muscle cell, we will find several mitochondria, which are organelles involved with ATP production. Now, for mitochondria to produce ATP, mitochondria needs glucose and oxygen. And the protein that stores oxygen within a muscle cell is called myoglobin. Myo making a reference to muscle. And myoglobin is red pigmented. Now, let's think about this. A muscle that is a high endurance muscle, such as the muscle that we would find in the chicken leg, uses more ATP. It uses more energy because that muscle that the chicken is using to run around is a high endurance muscle. So it needs lots of energy. And in order to produce energy, in order to produce ATP, that muscle needs lots of oxygen. So in a high endurance muscle, we would find lots of myoglobin, which is the protein that stores oxygen within a muscle cell. Correct? Yes. Have you noticed that the meat that you have in a chicken leg is darker than the chicken breast meat? Yes, guys. And the reason for that is the amount of myoglobin that was present in the chicken leg needed to be much higher than the amount of myoglobin present in the chicken breast. And myoglobin is red pigmented. And with that in mind, you can easily remember that a high endurance muscle will have darker color than a muscle that's not high endurance. And the reason for that is the high amount of myoglobin, the red pigmented protein that stores oxygen within a muscle cell the oxygen that is necessary for the mitochondria to produce ATP. Now, let's go back to our skeletal muscle cell drawing. Here we have a piece of a single skeletal muscle cell. And when we look at a skeletal muscle, we see several skeletal muscle cells like this. And we also see that surrounding every single skeletal muscle cell and filling up the gaps between every single skeletal muscle cells, we have connective tissue. And this connective tissue found hugging every single skeletal muscle cell and in between skeletal muscle cells is called endomysium. 
Now, all these skeletal muscle cells are wrapped together in a group. And this wrapping is another connective tissue layer that wraps all these cells together in a fascicle. And this connective tissue that wraps all these skeletal muscle cells together in a fascicle is called perimysium. Now, this is a single fascicle in a skeletal muscle. And when we look at a skeletal muscle, what we see is several fascicles. And all these fascicles are wrapped by perimysium. And all these fascicles are wrapped together by another connective tissue layer called epimysium. So what we see in a skeletal muscle is not a bunch of skeletal muscle cells together. What we see is groups of skeletal muscle cells wrapped in connective tissue. Now, when we covered connective tissue, I told you that one of the characteristics of connective tissue was that connective tissue is highly vascularized. With the exception of cartilage, all connective tissue has lots of blood vessels, is highly vascularized. And we are seeing here connective tissue wrapping around groups of skeletal muscle cells or single skeletal muscle cells. So what you can expect is that in this wrapping of connective tissue, we will find blood vessels. We will find blood vessels carrying oxygen and nutrients to nourish these skeletal muscle cells. And we will find blood vessels that will remove waste products from the skeletal muscle cells. And besides blood vessels, can you guess what we can also see in this wrapping of connective tissue? We see nerve fibers. We see sensory neurons nerve fibers that will be there to detect what's going on in the skeletal muscle. For example, is that skeletal muscle overstretching? And we also see motor neurons nerve fibers that will be there to deliver the signal that will trigger the skeletal muscle cell contraction. So we have the endomysium wrapping around every single skeletal muscle cell. That's easy to remember because the root endo means within. So the endomysium is the most inside one. Then we have the perimysium at the periphery of the fascicle, which is a group of skeletal muscle cells. And the epimysium is the most outside layer we have wrapping around a skeletal muscle. And that's very easy to remember because epi makes a reference to the epidermis, which is the most outside layer in our skin. So the epimysium is the most outside layer in the skeletal muscle. And what do we see when a muscle, when a skeletal muscle is attaching to a bone is that the epimysium, the perimysium, and the endomysium, they all merge and they become this connective tissue tube that we call tandem. And this connective tissue that is the fusion of the epimysium, perimysium, and endomysium coming from the muscle fuses with the periosteum of the bone. So we have the connective tissue of the skeletal muscle merging, fusing with the connective tissue that is surrounding the bone. And this arrangement is essential for the function of the musculoskeletal system. Because every single time we are moving our body around, we are contracting a skeletal muscle that's pulling on a bone in our skeleton. And since this attachment of the muscle with the bone is based on the fusion of the connective tissue that we have in the muscle with the fusion of the connective tissue that's surrounding the bone, this attachment is extremely strong and very hard to be pulled apart. And that's why we can lift weights and our muscles don't just detach from the bones they were attaching to. Now, we know that there are people that can lift lots of weight, right? And if we think about bodybuilders, which are people that can lift lots of weight, we can clearly see that bodybuilders have very large skeletal muscles. Now, I told you before that skeletal muscle cells cannot undergo cell division after we are born. And my question is, how are those skeletal muscles in bodybuilders so big if skeletal muscle cells cannot undergo cell division after we are born? And the answer to this question is the skeletal muscle cells do not undergo cell division. We do not have an increase in the skeletal muscle cell number. What happens is that there is an increase in the number of myofibrils inside the skeletal muscle cells. And by increasing the number of myofibrils inside skeletal muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells get bulkier. They get thicker. And that causes the enlargement of the skeletal muscles. 
and this enlargement of the skeletal muscles is what we call hypertrophy. Now, what is very interesting is that when there is this increase in number of myofibrils, because the person is lifting lots of weight, is doing these resistance exercises, there is also the development of connective tissue around these skeletal muscle cells. And this all adds to the overall mass of the skeletal muscle. Now, there is a purpose for this development of connective tissue. And the purpose is to contain, to support the skeletal muscles as they can produce more and more and more powerful contractions. Now, if you have the development of connective tissue, you also have the development of stronger tendons. Because the tendon is the connective tissue layers, the endomysium, perimysium, and epimysium that merged and became this tube. So you have the tendons becoming stronger. And when the tendons become stronger, that prevents tendon damage. And the person is able to lift very heavy weights without having the tendons detaching from the bone. Now, sometimes instead of having this tube-like structure that is the tendon attaching a muscle to a bone, the epimysium, perimysium, and endomysium fuse and become a sheath of connective tissue. And this sheath of connective tissue receives the name of aponeurosis. And aponeurosis, like tendons, provide support to our muscles, such as strength and stability. So we have been talking about aponeurosis, tendons, epimysium, perimysium, endomysium. What do they have in common? They are all connective tissue, right? And have you heard of fascia? Fascia is a connective tissue sheath. And when this connective tissue sheath wraps around group of muscles, we call it deep fascia, or very specifically, we call it fascia of muscles. And fascia of muscles is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. And this sheath of dense, irregular connective tissue wrapping around group of muscles provides support and protection to the group of muscles it is surrounding. Now, I really want you to understand and see the difference between deep fascia or fascia of muscles and fascicles. We know the definition already, but it's always good when we look at an image because then we can really see what's going on. Here you have three images that you find in your lab terminology list, and we are focusing at this moment in the thigh area. We have the medial view, anterior view, and posterior view of the thigh. When we look at the anterior view, we can identify several muscles, such as the rectus femoris muscle. And you remember, the rectus femoris muscle was named rectus because rectus means straight, and it's going straight down. Femoris because the bone we have in our thigh is the femur. So this is the rectus femoris muscle. We have here in the lateral side of the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, in the medial side, the vastus medialis, and posterior to the rectus femoris right here, we would see the vastus intermedius. Together, the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius are four muscles. And these four muscles form the quadriceps femoris. And obviously, they were named quadriceps because the root quad means four. And we have four muscles. Like when we divided the abdominal cavity into quadrants, we had four quadrants. Now we have four muscles forming the quadriceps femoris. And the quadriceps femoris is in the anterior aspect of our type. Now we also see right here, crossing from side to side, the longest muscle in our body, which is called sartorius, right? So this is the sartorius. This is all in the anterior aspect of the thigh. When we look at the posterior aspect of the thigh, here in the posterior view, we see the biceps femoris, biceps because it has two heads, and the biceps femoris is always lateral, because biceps femoris is on the fibula bone side, remember that? And the fibula is always lateral, fibula, lateral, fibula, lateral. So the biceps femoris is on the fibula bone side. Consequently, the biceps femoris is always lateral. When we look medially, we have the semitendinosus. And the semitendinosus is T4 tendinosus, T4 top, because it is on top of the semimembranosus. So here we have three muscles. Biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus, and these three muscles form the hamstrings. Here in the medial view, we can also see the semitendinosus on top of the semimembranosus. Now, what I want you guys to focus in the medial view 
is the gracilis muscle. Then we have right here the adductor longus. And here the adductor magnus. The adductor magnus is the magnificent one, is the big one. It goes underneath the gracilis and continues right here. So all this that starts here and goes underneath the gracilis and also goes underneath the sartorius is the adductor magnus. Now let's imagine that we have a transverse section of the tie right here. And we will look at this transverse section from a superior view. And if we're looking at this transverse cut, this transverse section in a real person, the first thing we would see is the skin on the most outside part. And then underneath the skin, what do we have? We have the subcutaneous layer. Remember that? And the subcutaneous layer has adipose tissue in it. And that's why I drew it in yellowish. Now, we know the only bone we have in our tie is the femur. So we are drawing the femur bone right there. Now we can start adding the muscles. We know that in the anterior aspect of the thigh, we have the rectus femoris muscle. Medial to the rectus femoris, we have the vastus medialis. Lateral to the rectus femoris, we have the vastus lateralis. And posterior, we have the vastus intermedius. And crossing from side to side, we have right here the sartorius. So let's put the sartorius based on our cut level. The sartorius would be right here. When we look at the posterior aspect of the tie, we would see the biceps femoris, always lateral, so it will have to be the same side of the vastus lateralis, right? We have the semi-tendinosus on top of the semi-membranosus, and these are our hamstring muscles. And when we look in the medial side, we would find the gracilis, we would find the adductor longus, and the adductor magnus, correct? Now, guys, what happens is that when we look at our tie, we have three different compartments. We have the anterior compartment, posterior compartment, and the medial compartment. The anterior compartment of our tie includes the muscles in the anterior aspect of our tie, the quadriceps femoris muscles and the sartorius. The posterior compartment of our tie includes the hamstring muscles. And the medial compartment of our tie includes the adductor muscles, which are the muscles that adduct our tie. Gracilis, adductor magnus, and adductor longus. These green lines that I drew that are dividing our tie into compartments, anterior, posterior, and medial compartments, is the fascia, the deep fascia, the fascia of muscles. The fascia of muscles surrounds group of muscles and give extra stability and protection to those group of muscles. And this is literally what you're seeing in our tie. Now, a fascicle, if you recall, is the group of muscle fibers that are bundled together and surrounded by the perimesium. That is a fascicle. Now, I would like you to look at the rectus femoris muscle that we have here. Can you notice that the rectus femoris muscle has lines that we see running in this direction, and we also see lines running in this direction? Can you see that? So we have two different directions. Guys, these that we are seeing right here are all muscle fascicles running in this direction. And right here, we have muscle fascicles running in this direction. Now, we know that a fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers wrapped by perimesium. And we know that fascicles are wrapped together by the epimesium. And that forms the skeletal muscle. So what I'm telling you is that all these fascicles are wrapped together by the epimesium. And then we have the rectus femoris muscle. And the rectus femoris muscle, together with the vastus medialis, the vastus lateralis, the vastus intermedius, and the sartorius muscles, are wrapped around by the fascia of muscles. And that forms the anterior compartment of our thigh. So now you can really see the difference between fascia of muscles and fascicle. Now, it turns out that depending on the pattern of organization of the fascicles, we can classify the muscles into different groups. So if you look here at the sartorius muscle, this one, and we can also see in this image, you can clearly see that the fascicles in the sartorius muscle are all parallel to each other. And that's a different pattern than the pattern we saw in the rectus femoris muscle. And muscles that have fascicles that run parallel to one another are classified as 
parallel muscles. And the great majority of skeletal muscles in our body are parallel muscles. And we can have parallel muscles that have a fuse form shape. And we have parallel muscles that they do not have a fuse form shape. So they are non-fuse form muscles. And they have more like a rectangular shape, like we are seeing here in the sartorius muscle. Now look at the biceps femoris muscle right here. We see the fascicles running parallel to one another. And we have this fuse form shape. Consequently, the biceps femoris muscle is a parallel muscle that falls into the category of fuse form muscle. You see the same structure in the biceps brachii muscle, right? The biceps brachii muscle is also a parallel muscle because the fascicles are running parallel to one another. And we have this fuse form shape. So it is specifically classified as a fuse form parallel muscle. Now, if we look back at the rectus femoris muscle, we can see that all these muscle fascicles are connecting in an angle to a central tendon that's running through the length of the muscle. Can you see that? And when we have this arrangement of a tendon running through the length of a muscle with fascicles attaching to it in an angle, that is what we call pennate. Now, since in the rectus femoris muscle, we have fascicles on both sides of this central tendon. We specifically call the rectus femoris muscle a bipennate muscle. When we look at the deltoid muscle, which is this muscle that we find in our upper limb that has the delta letter shape, but it is upside down. And that's the reason why the deltoid was named deltoid. We see that the deltoid muscle has a central tendon that branches into more tendons. And we have one of these branches going to the posterior aspect, another one is staying laterally, and another one going anteriorly. And these tendon branches are now the point that the fascicles connect, right? Now, when we have this arrangement, we have fascicles in a multitude of directions. Correct? And that's why the deltoid muscle is an example of a multi-penate muscle. Multi for a multitude of directions. Now, we also see in our body a central tendon with fascicles connecting in only one side of this central tendon. And with that information in mind, how do you think we classify this type of skeletal muscles? We classify them as unipennate. Uni making a reference to the unique side of the central tendon that has fascicles connecting. Now, an example of unipennate muscle is the muscle that allows us to flex our thumb. And that muscle is the flexor pollicis longus. It has the word pollicis in its name because that makes a reference to the pollux, which is the anatomical name for thumb. Now, besides having muscles that have fascicles that are all parallel to one another, which we classify as parallel muscles, besides having muscles that have a central tendon and have fascicles running in an angle along the length of the central tendon, which we call pennate muscles, we have muscles that cover a considerably large area and all the fascicles, they converge to a single point of attachment. And when we have this arrangement, we classify the muscle as a convergent muscle because all fascicles are converging to a single point. And an example of a convergent muscle is the pectoralis major muscle. Now, if we look around the lips of Philip and also around the eye, we see muscle fascicles arranged in a concentric way, like circles around an opening. And when we have these circle-like arrangements around an opening, we classify the muscle as a circular muscle. And examples of circular muscles are the orbicularis oris around the oral cavity and the orbicularis oculi around the eye. Now, let's take a look at our biceps brachii muscle. We studied this muscle in the lab. And we know that the biceps brachii muscle 
is a muscle in the anterior aspect of our arm. The biceps brachii muscle has two heads. And that is why it was named biceps, because the root bi makes a reference to two, like a bicycle has two wheels. The root seps is the short for cephalic, which literally means head. And it's called brachii because the word brachium makes a reference to arm. The biceps brachii heads are named short head and long head. And we know that the long head of the biceps brachii is always the most lateral one because we have L for long, L for lateral. Now, one of the functions of the skeletal muscles is to move the bones in our skeleton. And that's the reason why they were named the skeletal muscles. Now, for a muscle to be able to move our skeleton, we need it crossing at least one joint. It can be one joint or more than one joint, like the case of the biceps brachii muscle. The biceps brachii muscle crosses three joints, the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, and also the proximal radial ulnar joint. Because the biceps brachii muscle goes from the scapula all the way down to the radius bone. And this connective tissue that we see here, the biceps brachii connecting to the radius bone, specifically at the radial tuberosity, and in the proximal end, the long head and the short head connecting the biceps brachii to the scapula. This is a connective tissue connecting bone and muscle, connecting two different things. So this connective tissue is what we call tandem. So we have two tandems on the proximal end, specifically the long head and the short head of the biceps brachii, and we have one tendon connecting the biceps brachii to the radial tuberosity. Now, as I mentioned before, a tandem is the endomysium, perimysium, and epimysium that we have making up the muscle getting together, and then this tandem fuses with the periosteum of the bone. And that's why we can lift heavy weights and our muscles do not detach from the bones they are attaching to. Now, this middle part of a muscle is what we call the belly of the muscle. And the belly of the muscle is what will get shortened every time the muscle contracts. And what we see in muscle contraction is that we have one end of the muscle attaching to the bone that will move and the other end of the muscle attaching to the bone that barely moves or is stationary. And the end of the muscle that's attaching to the bone that barely moves or that's completely stationary is what we call origin. And the end of the muscle that is attaching to the bone that moves is what we call insertion. And in muscle contraction, the rule is that every time a skeletal muscle contracts, the insertion pulls towards the origin. So we have in the case of the biceps brachii muscle, the radial tuberosity being pulled towards the origin, which is in the scapula. And when this happens, the biceps brachii muscle contraction can cause supination of our forearm. Also, when the biceps brachii muscle contracts, it can cause flexion at the elbow joint. And since the biceps brachii also crosses the shoulder joint, contraction of the biceps brachii muscle can also flex at the shoulder joint. Now, guys, I'm just saying supination and I'm just saying flexion because I assume you know what supination is, what flexion is. I assume you know all the synovial joint movements we studied in the joints chapter. If you don't know those movements very well, please go back and watch those videos. That is crucial knowledge for you to be able to understand this chapter well. Previously, we saw that the biceps brachii is a muscle in the anterior aspect of the arm and that the biceps brachii goes from the scapula all the way down to the radius bone. Since the biceps brachii is in the anterior aspect of the arm and it crosses the shoulder joint and the elbow joint, when the biceps brachii contracts, it can flex at the elbow and also flex at the shoulder because it crosses both joints. We know that we can flex our forearm and that we can also extend our forearm. And extension is the opposite movement of flexion. Now, for us to be able to extend our forearm, the muscle 
needs to be in the opposite side of the biceps brachii. So if the biceps brachii was anterior to the humerus, is in the anterior aspect of the arm, the muscle that will cause the opposite movement needs to be in the posterior aspect of the arm. Also, for this muscle to be able to extend my forearm, this muscle needs to attach to a bone in the forearm. This muscle needs to cross the elbow joint, the same joint that the biceps brachii crossed to cause flexion. And when we look at the skeletal muscles in our body, what we see is that they work in pairs. If we have one muscle or group of muscles causing flexion, we will have a muscle or group of muscles causing extension. Now, the main muscle that causes a specific movement is called the agonist, also called prime mover. The muscle that causes the opposite movement is called antagonist. Now, in our body, we know that we have more than one muscle capable of causing the same movement. And the muscles that are capable of causing the same movement, but they are not the agonist, the main muscle, they are called the synergist muscles. Based on our example of flexion at the elbow joint, can you tell me what would be the agonist muscle? The agonist is the biceps brachii muscle. Can you tell me what would be the antagonist muscle? What is the muscle that is causing the opposite movement that the biceps brachii caused? That would be the triceps brachii muscle. Now, the synergist muscles are the muscles that will be helping the agonist, the biceps brachii, to cause flexion at the elbow. And these helpers must be crossing the elbow joint to be able to cause flexion at the elbow like the biceps brachii does. And these synergist muscles that help the biceps brachii are the brachialis and the brachioradialis muscles. So for flexion at the elbow joint, the agonist is the biceps brachii muscle. The synergist muscles, the little helpers, are the brachialis and the brachioradialis. And the antagonist, the muscle that does the opposite movement of flexion, which is extension, is the triceps brachii muscle. Now, if you're talking about extension at the elbow joint, can you tell me which is the muscle that is considered the agonist? If you're talking about extension at the elbow joint, now the agonist will be the triceps brachii muscle. Because the triceps brachii muscle is the main muscle, the prime mover, causing extension at the elbow joint. And the antagonist the muscle that's causing the opposite movement of extension will be the biceps brachii muscle. So you always need to remember our muscles work in pairs and you need to take into consideration the movement in question to be able to correctly say the agonist, antagonist, and synergist muscles. And with this, we finish this lecture. I really need you to come with all this knowledge to our class because we will be going over several skeletal muscles and skeletal muscle groups we have in our body and their movements in the classroom together. So get ready for lots of movement and fun. See you in class. Bye.